Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is John Samet, uh, the Dean of the Colorado School of Public Health, and welcome to the State of the School 2020. To say the least, uh, this is uh, a particular uh, year and one that we will all uh, remember. If you have thoughts to these uh, questions uh, that are posted here, put them in the chat and it would be great to uh, hear your uh, thoughts. Today we're doing something different, uh, as you will see with uh, some introductory comments from myself, and then moving on to uh, panels that will cover our uh, areas of uh, practice, uh, research, and uh, efforts related to uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and uh, racism. If you hang on till the end of the hour, we're going to have uh, the uh, Dean's Door Prize, a uh, a lottery and the opportunity to uh, win a very good box of chocolate. In fact, we'll be giving away three boxes of uh, chocolate. So Megan, if you can go ahead with the first slide. And State of the School, December 17th, 2020, a year that we will all uh, remember. We're gonna do something different uh, this year, as I mentioned, and here's our schedule. I'm gonna make these introductory remarks. And then we have three, uh, panels led by our associate deans in the area of public health practice, research, inequity, and uh, racism. Uh, this uh, rescues you from um, too much PowerPoint from me, and I think an opportunity to hear from uh, the school's leaders. Next. I think to say that this is a year marked by so many things is uh, an incredible uh, understatement. It's been, um, a year uh, in which uh, public health has been at the forefront. It's been a year in which uh, public health practice has both been uh, saluted uh, and uh, diminished. We're facing a national change in leadership uh, that will likely bring new emphases uh, and uh, new opportunities for uh, public health and hopefully a concerted focus on bringing an end to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, within the United States and globally. If we look at the next slide, there are implications here for uh, public health coming out of the uh, current context and this year. I refer you to the November issue of the American Journal of uh, Public Health and a number of articles, including one on which uh, I'm a co-author with uh, Ross uh, Brownson, uh, Tom Burke, and uh, Graham Kolditz. Reimagining public health in the aftermath of a pandemic. I suspect we'll see many discussions of this sort. What have we learned? What are our failings? Where do we need to build uh, capacity? What did we do right? Uh, and uh, I think uh, this kind of discussion will be part of what we will be doing uh, at the school. So I think a change in the national context will spill down and I think we'll have much uh, to discuss as we move forward. Next, go ahead with the next text. I, I think uh, to describe the events of the year, these word clouds, please go back, uh, are critical. Uh, the uh, COVID-19 uh, epidemic, its impact, the way we have changed how we do our business uh, for now, the way we have lived our lives. And of course, uh, the re-recognition and the emergence of the still persistent and deadly power of systemic racism uh, and the need to enhance diversity, equity, um, and inclusion. Next, we've taken steps in this area and I'm very proud of the school's activities related to SARS-CoV-2 and the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Some of them are listed here and there are many more. Just to thumb through a few of these, the uh, efforts of the modeling team coming from the School of Public Health and our campuses that have provided guidance to CDPHE and the governor, continuing. The uh, modeling done weekly, this just simply one of the plots of where we thought the epidemic was heading uh, several weeks ago. The uh, series we've carried out in collaboration with the Denver Museum of Nature uh, and Science uh, culminating yesterday with a presentation by Nicholas Christakis, uh, author of Apollo Zero, a book I would recommend to you all. And 
our engagement with uh, contact tracing uh, that you will hear more uh, about uh, subsequently. Again, uh, all a part of the efforts that we've made as a school, uh, students, faculty, and staff to uh, engage. And then activities related to structural racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. The elaboration of a plan, the recruitment of Cerise Hunt to be Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. You'll hear from her at the uh, end of the hour. Uh, much going on at our department and unit uh, levels. Focus for now internally, but I think thinking about how the school in the end will have an impact uh, externally. Uh, the new Colorado School of Public Health Diversity and Inclusive Excellence Scholarship Fund, uh, one motivated by faculty member Don Comstock stock and supported uh, by many uh, faculty, uh, staff and uh, others and uh, soon to be utilized to uh, support uh, our students. Next. So bottom line here, we've, we've come through a, a lot. Uh, there have been times when uh, there were serious potential financial constraints as we looked at how much uh, funding might be forthcoming from the state. Um, we did not know what student numbers might be and uh, an enrollment. But bottom line, we're okay. And I'm glad that I can say okay. And, you know, I maybe even exaggerate and say better than okay. I think we're very well positioned uh, to come out of this year stronger in so many ways from what we've learned. So next. So we, we've had leadership changes and uh, Teresa Sharp taking leadership at uh, the University of Northern Colorado, Lisa Miller in public health practice, Cerise Hunt, in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and Danny Britton coming from UNC to take over in our new uh, combined Office of Academic and Student Affairs. New leadership brings change, it brings new ideas, and we're right in the midst of seeing uh, our new leaders have their uh, impact on how we do things as a, uh, as a school. Next. We have continued to uh, recruit faculty, uh, albeit uh, guardedly in the face of the pandemic and its consequences, but here are some of uh, our new faculty coming into different areas with broad uh, background. Uh, for example, Ali Abraham in uh, epidemiology, ophthalmological diseases, HIV AIDS, Talia Kwandalesi, um, an infectious disease modeler a recruit for the moment. Uh, Lauren coming in health economics, health systems management and policy and more. So I, we continue to have the opportunity to uh, bring in uh, the next generations uh, and uh, I look forward to the contributions of these uh, new faculty members. Next. So in terms of uh, numbers, there's uh, been a rise as you likely know in uh, interest in the uh, Master of Public Health program. Uh, here we're looking at this year and the prior two years. You can see the dip in student numbers in 2019 and the rise in student numbers in 2020. Uh, next to the, uh, yeah, so this, uh, our, our increment of 21.1% in overall um, applications is higher than what has been experienced by our colleagues across the nation as shown by the statistics from the Association of Schools and Programs in Public uh, Health. As the applications have come in for next year, uh, interest has remained high. And uh, I would hope that this uh, sort of reemergence of public health, resurgent interest, some undoubtedly reflecting the COVID-19 pandemic will be sustained and that there will be new uh, opportunities for uh, our graduates. Next. So finances, uh, deans worry about many things. Uh, high on the list, of course, is uh, our fiscal picture and, and security. This uh, year resolved itself uh, better than anticipated in part because the state funding gap was filled with support that came from the federal CARES Act. Student uh, enrollment has been higher than anticipated 
And our faculty and staff have stepped in uh, and giving back through uh, furloughs and other ways to uh, reduce the financial load on the school. So in a way, I'm pleased that we actually have the opportunity perhaps to not leave this year having uh, dipped into our reserves, but perhaps to leave uh, having actually incremented uh, reserves. That's good because there's always next year. And for next year right now, fiscal year 22, we really don't know uh, very much. We don't know what will happen with the state or whether there will be something akin uh, to the support we received from the CARES Act. Next. We had some uh, philanthropic uh, highlights, uh, substantial donation to uh, endow our Center for Health, Work and Environment, uh, funding received from various uh, philanthropic uh, organizations. Uh, I mentioned um, already the uh, new fund to support students for uh, diversity uh, and inclusive uh, excellence. Funding received to uh, support the modeling efforts and public dissemination. So it's been um, a, a good year and hopefully we will continue on this trajectory. Then next, please. Uh, our strategic planning, which was uh, com completed with the plan being brought to a close in the fall um, was held, put on hold the implementation by the exigencies of the pandemic. We're now back to uh, implementing uh, the plan and shifting the priorities uh, some, but this activity is in uh, progress. Next. So, uh, and our faculty uh, and students have done well, and I'm just gonna show you uh, on the next, uh, some of the awards um, received by faculty. And I think the point I'd like to make here is that there are many. Uh, and uh, if we had time, we would have gone to the, through the many other awards uh, received uh, by faculty, staff, and students. I'm proud of uh, the uh, efforts of uh, everyone, uh, not only with the pandemic, but with all that we do in public health. So next. So now I'm going to turn to our first uh, panel, panel on public health uh, practice, uh, and turn things over to um, Lisa Miller, Associate Dean for Public Health Practice. Lisa. Thank you, Dean Samet. So with our 15 minutes, the way we're going to spend the time is I'm going to give you a, a brief overview and talk about how we're moving some things forward in the area of public health practice. And then I'm gonna turn it over, importantly, to two students who are actually doing public health practice. So you're gonna hear from them directly about their experiences and how those interact with, with their coursework. Um, and those two panelists are Shelby Davis, an MPH student here on the AMC campus, and Raisa Huntley Fryer, who is an MPH student on the CSU campus. Next slide, please. So I want to start out with a poll, a little, a little interaction. Um, please vote A, B, or C. Um, how do you define public health practice? The first couple definitions, one is um, a little brief. Um, the second one is a little longer. And um, the third one is a choose your own adventure. So put in the chat if, if you don't agree with either of those and maybe we'll get some ideas for um, a better a better definition. So it looks like uh, people are gravitating toward the longer, the longer definition looks like about 75, um, 20 ish for the first one. And then uh, a few suggestions in the chat. Okay, thank you. Um, that's very helpful. Next slide. <laughs> So one of the things um, that we're gonna do with those results will be related to some of the efforts we're, we're doing moving forward. And that is creating a public health practice committee. So we have standing committees that are defined in the faculty bylaws for research, 
for education and curriculum um, and a couple other committees. But to this point, we haven't had a public health practice committee. So that is one thing we've proposed to add and the edits have been submitted. Unfortunately, that takes quite a while to get through the process of um, making those edits permanent. So in the interim, we have proposed to the Faculty Senate that we create an ad hoc public health practice committee and the Faculty Senate approved that. It may take up, a two, up to a year to get a permanent committee as defined in the Faculty Senate bylaws. We also have chosen a chair um, with the input from the, the Faculty Senate leadership and the Dean and Virginia Visconti, thankfully, has agreed to chair the committee. Virginia has a lot of experience in this area and along with Lee Newman, she co-chaired the strategic planning public health practice um, section. We do want the committee to have broad representation from all our departments and centers. And I know some of you have already reached out to me and, and we know who you are. And we will make sure that you are part of that committee. We'll be doing some more reaching out in 2021 to further populate the committee. But the intent is really to have this broad representation. And the, the purpose of this committee will be to advise the Dean and um, the Associate Dean for Public Health Practice on how we implement the strategic plan for our public health practice objectives. The priority objective that came out of the prioritization efforts is to strategically develop partners and partnerships to advance equity and social justice. So this will be a, a major and primary or priority push for the committee. And next slide. So I did want to say just a little bit more about something that the Dean mentioned, the CDPHE student contract where CDPHE hired 75 students from the school part-time to participate in case investigation, contact tracing and other COVID related activities. This was all, this was all remote. Um, and I want to give you one um, quote from one of these students. Um, the student said, I wanna thank the school for fostering the relationship with the CDPHE and giving students the opportunity to engage in this work and contribute to the response against the pandemic. It's been an invaluable experience. So I, I think this has been successful. Certainly there's been some lessons learned along the way, but um, it's something that I think has certainly contributed to the response in Colorado. And I wanna thank all those students that, that contributed to that effort. It's, it's been very important. Um, and speaking of, so I, I want to turn it over now to actually a student who's been doing that work. So our first um, student who's going to talk will be Shelby Davis, and she'll talk about her experiences in that role. Yes, thank you, Dr. Miller. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Shelby Davis, and I'm a second year MPH epidemiology student here at the Colorado School of Public Health. Um, when asked to speak about public health practice, I was really excited because I get to talk about something that I love, uh, which is my job. In April, I was given the amazing opportunity to start work uh, as a COVID-19 case investigator and contact tracer uh, for CDPHE through the Colorado SPH contract. Um, in this experience, I have not only been able to grow as a public health professional, um, but I've also been able to directly apply knowledge I've taken from my courses here um, at the School of Public Health. Uh, through CDPHE's contract with AmeriCorps, um, we get to meet a whole bunch of people from a variety of backgrounds and walks of life, um, but some don't have the same in-depth public health background that we have. Um, so my fellow student tracers and I that I work with have um, been able to kind of bridge that knowledge gap by explaining how and why these interventions work by using knowledge we gained in our foundational courses. So Foundations of Public Health, HSMP, um, Intro to Epi, um, all intro classes. Um, and perhaps one of the highlights of my time with the CICT program was being able um, to assist in leading a large scale outbreak investigation in one of our smaller counties. And during the investigation, I was able to apply knowledge I had gained from my previous infectious disease epi course I had taken just the semester before. And I was currently in an outbreak investigations course. Um, so I was able to apply all of that knowledge I had just gained to a real time example, which was absolutely priceless. Um, and I'm forever thankful for that experience. I have learned and continue to learn so much about functional public health practice while being able to see a program grow from literally a handful of students to over 200 investigators. And it feels so surreal to be able to be a part of that. 
Um, and I'll be forever grateful to the School of Public Health um, for that career launching opportunity. All right. Thanks so much, Shelby. So our next student who's going to talk is Raisa Huntley Fryer, and she's going to talk about her experiences, which, which are a little different. Um, thanks, Dr. Miller. I will try to be really quick with this. Um, so we're doing a 10 week observational study on mask usage um, on the CSU campus, and we're interested in measuring two proportions. One is the proportion of people on campus who are wearing masks. And the other is of those people, <laughs> the proportion who are wearing them correctly. This effort was put together by Dr. Molly Gatilla here at CSU. Um, we partnered with CSU leadership, CDC staff here in Fort Collins who are part of the um, COVID-19 response team, uh, CDPHE and the Larimer County Department of Public Health and Environment. Dr. Gatilla recruited me to help organize and execute a plan for collecting observations here on campus. And then we recruited um, a group of MPH students who generously volunteered to sit out in the cold and spy on their fellow students. Uh, <laughs> we're using a protocol that the CDC staff member trained us in and it's intended to minimize um, bias in our data collection. Um, but actually implementing that protocol means running through a lot of practical considerations. We'd initially picked observation points based off of a map of cell phone activity on the campus. Um, so kind of looking on campus where people were moving around the most, where there was the most foot traffic. Um, but then I needed to go and physically scout out the locations and think, okay, is this a place where, you know, I can actually sit and have a good view of people? Um, Dr. Miller asked me to think on how this experience uh, informed my understanding of what public health practice is. And I think I have two takeaways for that. One is the importance of leaning on the kind of everyday practical skills that we as students already bring into, um, already bring into this work, mainly clear communication, organization, and flexibility. The second takeaway I think would be that I've heard a lot about the importance of partnerships in public health practice in my academic work, uh, but my understanding of how that actually works and how it really looks in real life uh, was pretty murky. So I think this project has clarified for me how partners might really coalesce around a shared goal. Um, and it's really clear to me in this instance why each of our partners would be interested in supporting this project um, and why they're interested in the outcome. And also why it would be hard for any one of us to do this alone, given that there isn't funding for the project. Um, I should mention also that there's six other universities who are doing this study on mask usage, um, but they're all concentrated in the Southeast. So it's pretty cool. I think that CSU is gonna be the first school in the Western region of the US to participate. And I think that that might make it a little more interesting to kind of compare mask usage across different schools. So far, CSU appears to be doing really well with masks. Um, in our baseline week, we found that 96.9% .9 were wearing masks. And in our first week of follow-up, we found 92.3% wearing them. Uh, for both weeks, the, the proportion of people who were wearing them correctly was 95, 96%. So really looking good. Um, the plan is to do nine more weeks of follow-up when we go back to in-person learning in the spring. Um, that's our plan. Of course, that's kind of up to up to change if campus doesn't stay open until spring break or if campus doesn't reopen in the spring. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you. And I, again, thank, thanks to both of you. I, th I think that's so powerful to hear directly from our students about their public health practice activities and how they really supplementing uh, and interdigitating with what they're learning in courses. So thank you so much. And I'm um, so glad that you, you both have had these great experiences and happy to hear that the mask usage is, is quite high on the CSU campus. We don't have time for questions during this format, but I'm happy to take questions if anyone wants to email me. So feel free to do that if there are other things that you have questions about regarding public health practice. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Kathy Bradley for the next segment, which is on research. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and for their session for our panel on research, I've invited three speakers, Drs. Chu, Leiberman, 
and Mays and ask them two questions. Um, first is to talk a little bit about their research that's related to COVID-19 and the kinds of things that they've been doing. And then the second question is to identify what's the next big step um, for them and where they plan to go and for us to think about as a school in terms of investment and where, where we wanna put our creative energy, energies into. So I'll turn it over to the panelists, um, starting with Dr. Chu. So thank you very much for inviting me to give a few minutes and give you an update of what we've been doing. What a year, right? Have you all just expected, this year was not what, how it's developed, it's not what we started out to be. It's so different. But also it tells you a little bit about how public health community can come together. And at the beginning of the year in February at the World Health Organization, there was a meeting on the newly emerging coronavirus and there was a lot of work to be done. And so as part of that, we were, we fund, we were funded with, by Gates Foundation to keep an eye on the quality of the diagnostic tests, especially the serology tests that uh, many of you have known and been involved with or think about. Um, the fact is that there's 479 registered um, tests on the market for serology. So you can imagine where West that is. And so we're learning to try to help coordinate and define what works and what doesn't work. The rest of my work has been on PPE. I never thought that I would ever have people understand what I mean when I say PPE, because most people need explanation, no more. So what we have done is with a collaboration by Open Philanthropy, and by Amazon and partners that we never would have reached out to fund us, uh, funded a project in which we've discovered a new application of a methylene blue, which is a dye some of you might know, and in sunlight it offs singlet oxygens and that kills viruses. So essentially a spray out on the mask in sunlight essentially will kill coronaviruses and you can do this anywhere, and especially for low resource settings, of course. And the, the last bit of that is that because of the methylene blue studies were very successful, we've been awarded by WHO for eight projects um, that we're coordinating out of uh, CGH and in the EPI department across the world on developing better methods and shifting the paradigm on public health response and the use of PPE. So I'm excited about that. And then the last piece of that, that one of those projects is here in Colorado because we seem to have a number of um, cases. And so that allows us to study what the asymptomatic, symptomatic exhaled virus might be. Lots of partners on here and thank all of them for doing this. And I think where we're going is a big shift um, in how we're gonna approach public and how we educate public, how we share information with public. We've been, um, we've had to learn it all over again. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Shu. Very exciting research. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Leiferman. Thanks, Dr. Bradley. So yes, I'm Jen Leiferman, uh, Chair and Professor of the Department of Community Behavioral Health, and I also direct the Rocky Mountain Prevention Research Center. And I was asked to just share some of the research we've done around COVID um, in the last few months. And you know, it really started with the Population Mental Health and Wellbeing Program taking the initiative to launch a national survey uh, right when the pandemic hit to better understand the mental health status and well-being, you know, of our country and especially here in Colorado. And unfortunately, when we looked at that data, it showed that there was a two to three-fold increase in anxiety and depression, um, and many were stressed, and that these rates were even higher um, for those who were unemployed, underinsured, or uninsured. Um, or who reported food insecurity. We have just recently collected a second wave of data following that cohort, and we're looking at analyzing that as well, but it doesn't show really much change in the mental health and distress uh, levels. Uh, we also have, through the center, uh, conducted a survey of families with young children uh, Dr. Puma is taking the lead on that, and we have not analyzed that data. It's still coming in. Uh, another piece, we've been interested in some more vulnerable, sensitive um, uh, populations, and 
Dr. Farewell and I did some work right when the pandemic hit to better understand what was happening with our, our pregnant women and the women in the postpartum period. And um, not surprising, these women reported high levels of stress and anxiety and uh, that they were very isolated and, and needing more connectedness. Um, and, and there was a strong sense of uncertainty around their care and um, taking care of their babies. So where are we moving hearing this? Because it's fairly distressing news. Uh, we have really started to think about how can we enhance care, like from a systems level, have worked with many partners, some here on today's call, um, across Anschutz and our community partners across Colorado, to really leverage our infrastructure to hopefully bring care, especially to our rural communities where it's much needed. Um, and then the second piece is to be thoughtful about how can we protect our well being. And I think this is gonna be really needed as we continue through the pandemic and then just through the whole recovery process. So we've been working again with our partners to think about creative ways to um, develop, implement and disseminate our programming and trainings to um, help people start taking care of themselves. So programs that uh, focus on things such as mindfulness, you know, are we exercising, are we sleeping well? Um, are we expressing gratitude? And I think probably the most uh, one that rises to the top uh, is connectedness. So are we trying to better understand how we can keep our connectedness through these times um, and think of innovative ways to reach our people, especially in vulnerable communities. So we have our work cut out for us. Thank you. And especially thank you for the last statements around wellness and reminding us all of how important that is and pointing to the highlights of opportunity for research as well. Now, our next speaker is Dr. Mays. Thank you so much, um, Glenn Mays. I'm uh, in the Department of Health Systems Management and Policy. And uh, just uh, we've got a lot of exciting work happening in, in our department among our talented faculty. Just a, I'll highlight a couple of uh, pieces of work we're doing around COVID. Uh, one is part of the Systems for Action Research Program. That's uh, a national research program uh, funded by Robert Johnson Foundation based in our department uh, here in Colorado, where we study ways of better connecting medical care delivery systems with public health delivery systems, as well as social service delivery systems to uh, advance the cause of health improvement and health equity. Um, as part of that work, we have a longitudinal study that's been going on now for about 20 years, the National Longitudinal Study of Public Health Systems, um, uh, originally funded by CDC, now with RWGF, where we uh, track a national cohort of about 600 communities across the country um, to study the networks of organizations at the community level that work together in implementing core public health activities and health improvement activities. Um, and so this gave us really, you know, serendipitously a nice opportunity when COVID hit to really study how these networks and how they vary across the country and change over time, these networks of relationships uh, may affect the response to the pandemic and uh, longer term recovery. Um, so we studied uh, how strongly or weakly public health organizations in these communities are connected to hospitals, and physicians, health insurers, employers, faith-based and community-based organizations, et cetera. Um, uh, and so obviously when COVID hit, it gave us really a natural experiment to study uh, how, how these networks have played out in terms of helping communities respond. We found that not surprisingly that stronger, more densely connected networks have fared much better during the pandemic in terms of slower growth in cases, uh, lower, mortali lower mortality and narrower racial and ethnic disparities in mortality again in these communities with stronger networks and more diverse networks in terms of the range of organizations connected working together. Uh, also networks, again, not surprising where public health agencies were positioned more centrally in those networks in terms of their influence um, and, and leadership uh, have, have um, uh, fared better, as well as networks that have stronger connections with some of the more traditionally peripheral players in public health work, especially employers. Uh, again, not surprisingly, as given what we know about how this um, pandemic has shaped out. Um, second study related uh, work that we have ongoing, uh, we lead the National Health Security Preparedness Index uh, funded by the CDC and also with uh, RWGS support, which measures uh, a broad array of capabilities in the medical, social and public health sectors that are needed to prepare for and respond to large scale hazardous events. 
Um, we measure this both at the state and at the county level all across the country annually. And again, uh, given that longitudinal national scope, it created a nice opportunity for us again to study uh, the array of capacities and capabilities that are shaping response um, and eventually looking at recovery from the pandemic. Um, in particular, with this data set, we're able to look at interactions between capabilities in medicine, in public health, and in the private sector, and look at the collective impact on pandemic progression and response. Uh, some of the highlights we found here is that capabilities in three key areas interacting together, public health staffing at the local level, uh, secondly, the av availability of volunteer medical staffing surge capacity in these communities. And thirdly, employer support through paid sick leave and support for remote work arrangements. Those three capabilities working together uh, interactively produced a, a significant um, kind of protect protective factors at the local level in terms of reducing health and economic effects of the pandemic. Uh, uh, so uh, out of time, but my future research question is really how best to reduce long term health and economic inequities that are caused by the pandemic that are likely to persist long after we get rid of this virus. That's our major focus going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mays. And uh, again, we hear this theme about connectedness and how important it is to have that in mind as we go through and have resilience and the ability to do well in these kind of crises. Also appreciate the last comment about um, equity. I'm gonna introduce our next um, panel, but want to let all of you know that if you have questions, feel free to email any of our speakers from today. And our next panel is going to be led by Dr. Cerise Hunt and it addresses equity and racism. Thank you, Dr. Bradley. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really um, happy to be here today. And I'm, I'm also going to have some panelists with me, um, Dr. Heather Kennedy, Guadalupe Solas, and Dr. Nancy Whitesell will be joining me in just a moment. But if we can go to the next slide, um, I just want to begin um, by talking about when I, when I first came on board, as you all know, I've been in this position for about two weeks now. One of my first tasks was to take a moment and learn about DEI efforts across the school. And all I can say is that it's been an enlightening experience. And so I'm just going to kind of highlight a few of the activities that are going on. Uh, Dean Salmon has expressed a few, but I'm just going to build up on a few. So the plan for dismantling Structural racism has already been discussed. What's great is that we're moved to the implementation phase. I'm going to take a moment to talk about the Inclusive Excellence Committee. I do have to give a shout out to my co-chairs in, in this process. We as a tri-chair committee that's been led by Chloe Binion and Twi Nguyen since 2016. And the committee has been very active in a majority of a lot of our efforts to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so I just want to thank the whole committee. If you want to get involved, it's a great committee. It's made up of faculty, staff, and students. And we worked, we worked on the plan to dismantle structure racism, the uh, current strategic plan. Another effort that's moving out is the whole course evaluation. Um, this past semester, there was two questions that were added to the um, course evaluation related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And there's plans to move forward on additional um, questions. When we look at admissions, there's a lot of great work. My colleagues in admissions have been doing some great work. The, as you all know, the MPH removed the requirement of the GRE. There's a team of folks that are working on a school-wide admissions advisory committee on uniform guidelines for equity-focused admissions review procedures. There's also a focus on four plus one dual degree programs to be a pipeline um, for students from the downtown Denver campus and, and just some strategic planning on recruitment of students of color from undergraduate programs from across Colorado. When we look at curriculum, you know, we know that there's health equity in all programs, but what's great is their discussion on how to incorporate health equity in all of our courses. And there's discussions on ways to increase public health presence in rural communities. Um, scholarships, we have, you know, we have a few scholarships, the Judith Albino Diversity Scholarship, the Hoffman Scholarship, 
Dean Salmonari talked about the Diversity and Inclusive Excellence Scholarship, which is new, and an international student scholarship. And the Dean did discuss the department and chair health equity activities. There's committees across the board, student led, students have been active in, in, in encouraging us to advance our diversity and inclusion mission. There's book clubs, different departments have their own structural racism and health equity plan. And then thanks to Faculty Senate, the focus of the all faculty meeting was addressing racism and advancing DEI. So there's a lot of great work. We have a strong foundation to continue to build up as we continue to move forward. So those are just a few highlights. And now as we move over to the next slide, I like to transition to the um, my panel discussion on advancing health equity and social justice and practice research. And I've invited three of my colleagues to kind of share about their efforts um, to advance equity and social justice. Guadalupe Solas, um, we'll start off with you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Cerise. Um, good morning. As I said, my name is Guadalupe. Um, I'm a current master's in public health candidate with a dual emphasis in epidemiology and health systems management and policy. Um, I am also an epidemiologist at Denver Public Health, currently working on Denver's COVID response. Again, thank you all for having me today. I would say a lot of the work that I've um, done with the university has really much aligned with the strategic plan, um, primarily centered on promoting equity and inclusion that for all students in our community. I would say most recently I've been working with um, a documented student services to push forward a student resolution that aims to make student life more obtainable for my DACA asset and undocumented peers, hopefully both in the present and in the future. This includes advocating for more financial aid and strong overall campus support at all levels for our students. At Accords, who is a consortium that you all might be aware of with the School of Medicine, I have been supportive in spearheading an initiative that aimed at giving faculty of color a voice um, on their opinions at work, um, the work environment, et cetera, in a predominantly white work environment to allow for our voices to be heard. And lastly, as an epidemiologist, I think I have pulled from both of these experiences um, in order to support the patient support program at Denver Public Health, which I've helped build and still kind of am helping build, uh, where we aim to specifically serve people, most of whom are immigrants and refugees from the Denver communities um, who need financial, nutritional, even legal support during their respite or during their quarantine. In a nutshell, this is what I've done to promote equity and justice at the school and even within the communities in which we live and grow. Again, thank you for having me. Thank you, Guadalupe. I just appreciate all the work that you've done. Dr. Kennedy, why don't you share what you've been up to? Thank you so much. We're honored to share the work of the Social Justice Youth Engagement Hub, which is part of the Center for Public Health Practice. The hub provides training and ongoing support to adults in Colorado and across the United States. Um, to engage you through a social justice youth development framework. The primary goal of the hub is to increase adults capacity to be able to sustain meaningful youth adult partnerships that bring young people from periphery to center in their decision making in their lives. The hub houses two current projects, Uprise, Colorado Social Justice Youth Tobacco Control Movement funded by the State Health Department, and the Sonder Project, which engages young people through expressive approaches to social emotional wellness in rural Colorado, funded by the Health Foundation. We're also providing coaching and training to youth serving organizations and researchers on a fee for service basis. Uprise is a flagship program of our hub. We seek to amplify the voices of Colorado's young people to create health equity. Uprise funds 20 youth serving organizations and schools across Colorado. All of the young people engaged in Uprise hold one or more marginalized identities. Each coalition goes through a process of identifying and addressing the root causes of youth nicotine use in their community. In Uprise, we talk about how power operates, how the tobacco industry has abused their power to create inequitable harm to communities and our environment, and how youth and adults can come together and create collective power to change the broken systems that contribute to youth suffering. You can learn more about Uprise on our website, upriseyouthmovement.org. Follow us on social media, Uprise Youth Movement, um, or I'll drop a link in uh, the chat box with our most recent video. But if you're seeking ways to more authentically partner with young people, please reach out to us. Pass it back to you, Cerise. Thank you, Dr. Kennedy. Dr. Weitzel, what have you been up to in your research as it relates to advancing <laughs> equity and social justice? Yeah, and I'm, I'm actually going to share an example of community-engaged work that's happening at the Centers for American Indian Alaska Native Health. 
um, that addresses health equity. I'm going to tell you about the Tiwahe Gluasha Cafe program. We call it TG. It grew out of 20 years of partnership between Cayenne investigators and the South Dakota reservation community. Research there documented persistent disparities in early and problematic substance use. And when we shared these findings with community partners, they urged us to help them find ways to prevent early use that would capitalize on both strong scientific evidence and cultural knowledge. So with funding from the National Institute on Drug Abuse back in 2013, we adapted an evidence-based substance use prevention program to strengthen family relationships and build youth resilience. And a Colorado School of Public Health faculty member, Alicia Musso, who is a tribal member who was living and working on the reservation at that time, led the integration of cultural kinship teaching throughout the curriculum. And we utilized a multi-phase optimization strategy trial to test some additional adaptations and build a TG program that was optimized for effectiveness, which is now being tested in RCT, or it would be if it weren't for COVID-19, it's on hold right now. But we have a merit award from NIDA that was awarded in 2019 that provides funding through 2029. So we'll have sustained funding to see this work through. So what is significant about this work for addressing equity? It addresses a longstanding health inequity. It represents a sustained partnership with community and a long-term commitment. It engages community members as critical partners at levels, all levels from conceptualization through dissemination. And it supported early career development of Native researchers, both Alicia Mousseau, who I mentioned, who actually was recently elected vice president of her tribe, um, and also Jared Ivanich, who joined our faculty here last summer and has come on with the TG team with the award of a supplement to TG to gather social network data. Also, just a shout out, he submitted an R21 proposal this summer that received a first percentile rank, so he's going to be getting additional funding to work in this community. And he directs the new certificate in American and Alaska Native Health. It also supported bringing Nicole to it, one of our own DRPH graduates back to join our faculty and she directs implementation of this project. And she submitted a K01 proposal for her own research to develop multi-level prevention for sexual risk and substance use among black and American Indian urban youth. So that's another way that this is addressing equity is in the work, research workforce as well. Awesome. This is one of you all have been busy. Um, and I have one more question as we wrap up our time together. Um, now, as you all know, we have a plan for dismantling structural racism and advancing inclusive excellence and a DEI strategic plan. And now each of you have reviewed the plans. What do you think we as a campus community should prioritize? So I know, um, okay, look, go on Lupe, you ready. Tell us, <laughs> what do you think? I'm ready. I'll start. I, I would say kind of just reflecting off of my experiences as a student, I do want to bring up the sense of isolation that that can come to students of color at this university. Um, mostly because again, right, we, we don't have many peers uh, who look like us. When I think of an immediate solution or even perhaps just a first step is supporting the peer groups or peer support clubs um, made on campus. I know that there's some, but we need financial support. We need campus support, campus backing. And then I think the second thing too is uh, alongside sort of the support of students is implementing culturally concordant mental health professionals that are available to us for mental health purposes, for, for stuff like that, um, who will understand our complex backgrounds. And then I think that just the second thing um, is really just, I, I, when I, again, think back on my time, right? Like I cringe when I talk to my peers about times when they, you know, I read this reading or I read this test question that had this very dehumanizing or offensive term like illegal immigrant or other very just dehumanizing or stigmatizing words. Uh, language matters and it can be hurtful and also just distracting to students overall. And so those would be my two recommendations and I do feel like both of these align with goals one and two of the strategic plan. But that's kind of what came to my mind first and foremost. Thank you. Heather, what, 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 what came to mind? Yeah, so it's not a surprise that I'd be eager to create efforts to create, create pipeline or other opportunities to outreach to middle high school and early college students to expose them to the array of possibilities available to them in the public health professions. And thinking about it a little bit more, I would say the most important aspect for dismantling racism is the integration of concepts 
and theories related to health equity, power privilege and oppression and social justice into our curriculum. Whether it's a class about biostats or health systems or program planning, it is critical to understand and take accountability for identity um, and our age, our class, our race and how it manifests power and how it filters our understanding of the world. So I think it's just really important to integrate more concepts that encourage students and faculty to be more reflexive about our intersecting privileged and marginalized identities and examine how this might filter the way we understand our health problems, the programs or the policies that we create or um, investigate. So I just really think it's about learning to partner with community instead of creating solutions for them. Okay, well, thank you, Heather. And Nancy, why don't you wrap us up? What are, what are your thoughts? Uh, so I think that the main thoughts that I have come from my experience with mentoring um, students and junior faculty, mostly in, in indigenous, from indigenous backgrounds, but I think thinking about how to support them and, and as, as a white person myself, like think they're not enough mentors um, from these communities and how do we better prepare people like me to be those mentors in the meantime and, and support, you know, give some guidance and not just say, I don't know how to do this, but how do we support that? And not just, I mean, getting people through the door is one thing, but as you know, as Guadalupe was, was referring to, how do we support them once they're here? And, and I think we've had a lot of focus on how to make people feel comfortable and successful in this community, in this culture, this academic culture. But I also think we need to go beyond that and to recognize what they bring and how they can change and shape our culture for the better. Like how can they make academic approaches better? How can they make scientific approaches better? And not ask them to leave their strengths at the door and become one of us, but how do they help us change who we are and really recognize that and make the place, make our culture comfortable enough that they can bring who they are through the door. And does that make sense? So I, I think that we need to change our system to be more inclusive in much deeper ways than, than we have thought about in the past. Thank you all for sharing of giving of your time um, and for the work that you all are doing to promote equity and justice in our communities. And with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Dean Samet. Great, I am back and just give me a second. Yeah, hello everybody. So first, uh, thanks uh, to everyone who participated in the panels and gave such uh, thoughtful uh, comments and uh, accounts of what you have been doing on so many uh, important um, important issues. Uh, this is the uh, school's uh, holiday uh, card uh, appropriate for the uh, year. I also want to uh, point out that as uh, Dean hanging out at home and doing the state of the school, I have on official uh, Colorado School of Public Health uh, clothing. I think the uh, presentations uh, today highlighted that we have many things to do. Uh, the list was always infinite. It's longer. And I think some, some components of the list have taken on a greater urgency uh, given 2020 and 2021 and what is to follow. I have no doubt that um, all of us, the school included, will be imprinted for the uh, future by um, 20, uh, 2020 and the events. And of course, as we head into 2021, we can be optimistic. Uh, a, a second vaccine is likely to be uh, approved uh, by FDA probably uh, tomorrow and uh, vaccination and its pace will increase. Uh, I'm hoping that as we look to the later summer and fall, we can think about having uh, a campus life uh, once again, uh, as much as is um, possible and we'll be returning to the things, the connectedness uh, that uh, is so important for uh, all of us, for our well-being, for our intellectual growth. We're doing much work internally, uh, as you've heard, that is um, really um, important. So I look forward to where we are at uh, next year's uh, state of the school 2021. Uh, we should be at a very different uh, point, hopefully with the uh, 
epidemic uh, coming to a close. This is still a pandemic, it reaches globally, and there's much work to do before everyone uh, on the planet is safe uh, and immunized. That is a very big job facing uh, all of us in, uh, in public health. So uh, here is the holiday messing message, uh, peace, joy, and masks, wear them. I was uh, uh, delighted to hear the good news from uh, CSU on mask uh, use. I think we're all doing our own uh, surveys as we walk around and look at whether people are wearing masks and whether they're sitting below their uh, noses or on chins, uh, but uh, good news from our students. So I think we need to uh, continue to uh, engage with the world on, uh, on public health, be ambassadors for public health, uh, advance public health. Sometimes we have to defend uh, public health as I'm sure many of you have now uh, ex experienced. Uh, the um, work will uh, continue by the school on uh, racism, diversity, equity, uh, and inclusion. And uh, I'm delighted that uh, Cerise joined to uh, help us and take leadership uh, in, that, um, in that area. So with that, uh, again, uh, thanks to all. Thanks for all you're doing. Have a good holiday. And then, of course, we have the all important door prize for the 177 uh, who are here. And for that, I'm gonna to turn to Kayla Gray and uh, Kayla is going to help out with uh, giving away these uh, spectacular boxes of chocolate, which come from <laughs> Boulder. Let's see. So Kayla, I'll leave things to you. We go. So I, I did see a few people leave since I just updated this. So hopefully we have everyone still here. So we still have peace drawing masks up. Do you want your wheel up or? Oh, yes. Let's see, Megan, maybe you can take down. Uh, there we go. Right. Are you able to see the winner of the first one, Cindy Z? He's still on. Uh-oh. Uh, okay, so Cindy is here. So um, great, congratulations. Cindy, do you need her email or what do you need to reach out to her? Maybe- uh, I'll, I'll reach out to her. Okay, all right, Cindy, we'll leave it to you. Okay, and next. And Cindy can't win. Twice. Stephanie was here. She put some good things in the chat. Mm -hmm. So Stephanie, are you on? All right, Bernie says she is on. Okay. Perfect, all right. We have uh, one more. Awesome. Good glory. All right. Okay, well, good. Well, thanks uh, so much for doing that, uh, Kayla. The uh, chocolate will shortly be in the mail. And again, thanks uh, to all for participating uh, today. And like everyone else, I will just uh, add that um, I'm always eager to hear from you. And if you have uh, suggestions, comments, and follow up of today's State of the School, uh, please uh, reach out uh, reach out to me. And with that, um, have a good uh, and safe holiday uh, and uh, rest up and uh, looking forward to uh, a, uh, a start towards normalcy in uh, 2021. Bye all.